Reference in eight. Sink 500. Reference. Sink 600. Jackie Bird, four legs. Dang. It might have been any of a hundred airfields. Templehof at Berlin, Orly at Paris, Dulles at Washington. It was an ordinary flight, but the plane, a jet called Air Force One, carried an extraordinary passenger. The time, shortly before noon. The date, November 22nd, 1963. of a prominent Boston family, John Kennedy's early memories were of election campaigns. He was exposed to the hurly-burly of big city politics, high-blown oratory, and brass bands by his maternal grandfather, John Honey Fitz Fitzgerald, former mayor and Democratic leader of Boston. Honey Fitz, with his Irish-American zest for living, displayed unusual talents in the pursuit of votes. Joseph and Rose Kennedy sent him to the finest prep schools in New England. Dexter, Canterbury, Riverdale, and Choate. By the time John was 17, the family had grown in size and fortune, and his father had become a multimillionaire. Two years later, Jack followed his older brother, Joe Jr., to their father's alma mater, Harvard University. A back injury kept John out of football, but he made the Harvard swimming team and was active in campus politics. In 1937, Joseph Kennedy was appointed ambassador to Great Britain by President Roosevelt. Ambassador Kennedy took John, then a sophomore, and Joe Jr. to England with him. In London, John began to think seriously about world events. In February 1939, he left college to become his father's secretary in London. The 21-year-old student roamed the continent, observing political conditions at first hand. He was an eyewitness to the growing turmoil on the left and right, which tore democracies apart and led to the growing power of dictators. watched the democracies appease the reckless moves of Hitler. He heard the approaching thunder of Mussolini's military aggression, and he saw the inevitability of world war. exploded over America at Pearl Harbor, John and Joe Jr. were already in the United States Navy. Joe was a Navy pilot and John became commander of PT Boat 109. 
In August 1943, PT-109 was ripped in two by a Japanese destroyer. Despite painful back injuries, Lieutenant Kennedy eluded capture, led his men to safety, and was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Medal for his bravery. A year later, Joe Jr. was killed on a bombing mission in Europe. John was now to assume the political ambition his father had held for his firstborn. In 1945, John Kennedy received a medical discharge from the Navy. He became a reporter assigned to the founding of the United Nations in San Francisco. His interest in world affairs increased when he covered the Potsdam Conference of the Big Three, Truman, Attlee, and Stalin. The following year, he returned to Boston and made his first move into politics, running for Congress from the 11th District. In his first race against nine other candidates, the Kennedy magic worked. At the age of 29, with the help of his family and college friends, John F. Kennedy won his first election. The freshman congressman, unnoticed and unknown in Washington, quietly went about his work. Fighting for his district, he established a reputation as the Massachusetts Maverick and was re-elected in 1948 and 1950. In 1952, Massachusetts Senator Henry Cabot Lodge was running for re-election. Victory seemed certain, so he was not alarmed when young Congressman Kennedy opposed him. But Kennedy put on a blistering campaign which took him to every city and town in the state. His drive produced a major political upset. Uh, Bobby, uh, my brother Bobby, who managed the campaign, perhaps he could give us some idea, more up to date, of what the final figures were. I think that... Uh what we got uh, up to about 20 minutes ago, that you were winning by about 70,000. There was about 100,000 more votes to come in. I think that that plurality was remaining. Yeah. That's out of about 2,250,000. Uh, so yeah. I think that that's about 5% of the vote. Good, fine. Well, I'm guess you're glad it's over, aren't you, Bobby? I am, Jack. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he was now the leading figure in Massachusetts politics. January 23, 1953, along with other new arrivals to the Senate, John F. Kennedy was sworn in by Vice President Alvin Barkley. Senator John Kennedy became Washington's most eligible bachelor. He renewed a romance with socialite Jacqueline Bouvier that had begun in 1951. In September 1953, they were married at St. Mary's Church in Newport, Rhode Island. 600 guests attended the wedding, which was consecrated by Archbishop Cushing of Boston and blessed by the Pope. A crowd of 3,000 fought for a glimpse of the glamorous newlyweds. More than 1,200 leaders of society and politics attended the reception for the young couple at the 300-acre estate of the bride's mother and stepfather. If you want any of those names, you can get them. I knew, I've been informed... During 1954, sure Senator Joseph McCarthy loomed large on the Washington horizon. His running fight with the Army and the State Department caused a controversy which brought a proposal for a Senate vote of censure against him. During the height of this battle, John Kennedy was rushed to a New York hospital for critical surgery on his back, a carryover from his war injuries. He failed to participate in the McCarthy censure and vote. While recuperating from two perilous operations, he wrote a book, Profiles and Courage, which became a bestseller and Pulitzer Prize winner. He returned to the Senate in 1955 and was a leading figure at the 1956 Democratic Convention in Chicago. He 
was given the honor of placing the name of Adlai Stevenson in nomination for president. Hello, delegates. I give you the man from Libertyville, the next Democratic nominee and our next president of the United States, Adlai E. Stevenson. Kennedy made a last-minute bid for the vice presidential nomination, but was unable to fight off the growing support for Senator Estes Kefauver, who won on the third ballot. Stevenson and Kefauver were now the Democratic standard bearers, and Kennedy campaigned vigorously for them. Their overwhelming defeat by Eisenhower and Nixon in 1956 diminished their careers, but left Kennedy's future unblemished. Kennedy returned to his desk increased in stature by his convention experience, ready to set his sights on the presidential nomination for 1960. He was assigned to the Senate Labor Rackets Committee headed by Senator McClellan, with Bobby Kennedy as its counsel and Barry Goldwater as a fellow member. He introduced a bill to correct abuses of big business and big labor. Opposing the bill was Jimmy Hoffa, leader of the Teamsters Union. I would be very happy to have our legal counsel here, our legislative representative here, assisting me in spending as much time as necessary to acquaint the American people with the fact that this is a strike-breaking, union-busting bill, in my well, opinion. Mr. Harper, this bill is not a strike-breaking, union-busting bill. You're the best argument I know for it. Your testimony here this afternoon, your complete indifference to the fact that numerous people who hold responsible positions in your union come before this committee and take the Fifth Amendment because an honest answer might tend to incriminate them. Your complete indifference to it, I think, makes this bill essential. In November 1957, a daughter, Caroline, was born to the John F. Kennedys. Bobby and his wife, Ethel, were the godparents. As Caroline grew, the Kennedys basked in the warmth of new parenthood. The maturing of the handsome young couple increased their popularity in Washington and Massachusetts. In the 1958 senatorial campaign, John was re-elected by the largest majority in the history of Massachusetts. A family strategy meeting was held. Younger brother Teddy joined John and Bobby to discuss John's political future. When the announcement was made that Kennedy would enter the New Hampshire presidential primary of 1960, his father was by his side. It was a proud moment for the elder Kennedy. A poor showing in the New Hampshire primary would end his presidential hopes. But he won by a large margin and went on to campaign in Wisconsin where he opposed Hubert Humphrey, a favorite son. Kennedy was a Catholic, and he met the highly controversial issue of his religion in characteristic forthright fashion. I would think that there is really only one issue involved in uh, the whole question of a candidate's religion. That is, does the candidate believe in the Constitution? Does he believe in the First Amendment? Does he believe in the separation of church and state? Now, when the candidate's given his views on that question, and I think I've given my views very fully, I think the subject's exhausted. <laughs> He clashed again with Humphrey in the West Virginia primary and won a decisive victory. With further primary triumphs, the road to the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles was clear. Only Lyndon Johnson stood in his way. Kennedy met his challenge head on before the Pennsylvania delegation. So I come to you today full of admiration for Senator Johnson full of affection for him, strongly in support of him for majority leader, and I'm confident that in that position, we're all going to be able to work together. Thank you. The convention gallery was crowded with vigorous supporters of Adlai Stevenson. On the floor, others were ready to move in if the Kennedy drive faltered on the first ballot. But this time, the Kennedy team was organized and ready. To lead us to a fruitful America, to a peaceful world for mankind everywhere, is the great senator from the state of Massachusetts, John F. Kennedy.
Mr. Chairman, Wyoming's vote will make a majority for Senator Kennedy. And I can assure all of you here who have reposed this confidence in me that I will be worthy of your trust. We will carry the fight to the people in the fall, and we shall win. It was a grueling, hard-fought campaign in which Kennedy tirelessly brought his vision of a new frontier in government to the people of America. Election night, Hyannisport. John Kennedy had won. So now uh, my wife and I prepare for a new administration and uh, for a new baby. Thank you. Later that month, a son, John F. Kennedy, Jr., was born. Uh, could you tell us, how is your wife, sir? Very well. She's fine. And the baby? Very good indeed. They're very uh, grateful for uh, them both being so well. And how are you feeling, sir, in this situation? Well, I'm all right. <laughs> Would you say it was a handsome baby, sir? Well, I don't know if I'd get to find a uh, baby. Does it look like you? No, well, I, uh, I'll have to, to study it some more. <laughs> On January the 20th, 1961, John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the 35th President of the United States of America. I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the small undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. The first major problem was Fidel Castro, Cuba's revolutionary leader who was receiving Soviet military aid. Castro warned his people that America was backing an invasion by Cuban exiles. His fiery accusation proved to be accurate when in April 1961 at a place called the Bay of Pigs, a landing was made by a Cuban exile brigade. I think that the members of the brigade uh, were under the impression that the planes which were available, which were the B-26 planes, uh, would uh, give them uh, protection on the beach. That uh, did not work out. That was one of the failures. The jets, the training jets, which we used against them, were very effective, and therefore we were not 
brigade was not able to maintain air supremacy on the beach. So that uh, I think that makes it clear. The, uh, as I've said from the beginning, the operation uh, was a failure and that uh, the responsibility rests with the White House. The Bay of Pigs disaster was a military and diplomatic defeat for the new president. Along with Secretary of State Rusk and Secretary of Defense McNamara, he realized that America's prestige had been seriously damaged. An invitation from Khrushchev to meet with Kennedy in Europe was accepted. It would give Kennedy a chance to face the Russian leader and propose a nuclear test ban treaty. Jackie, educated at the Sorbonne and fluent in French, accompanied her husband on this important venture into international diplomacy. But first, there was a state protocol visit to President de Gaulle of France. Curious Europe was anxious to appraise America's young new president, but it was Jacqueline with her beauty, charm, and dazzling American gowns who captivated the people of Europe. In Vienna, Khrushchev revived old Soviet complaints. Kennedy probed for new approaches to peace. At a time when both sides possess weapons of mutual destruction and annihilation, I think it's also valuable that there should be understanding and communication and a firm realization of what we believe. So I go to Mr. Khrushchev in Vienna. And I carry with me a message which is written on one of our statues by a distinguished and vigorous New Englander, William Lloyd Garrison. I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch. And I will be heard. but they reached no agreement at their first summit meeting. While President Kennedy was returning from his first European quest for peace, Khrushchev and the East German Communists had completed their blueprint for the total isolation of East Berlin. August the 13th, 1961, East Germany put an end to the flights of refugees to the West by building a wall to keep people in and freedom out. The wall became a hated symbol of oppression, of men and ideas, a heartless and cruel division of a city and a people. It is therefore our intention to challenge the Soviet Union, not to an arms race, but to a peace race. Let us call a truce to terror. The logical place to begin is a treaty assuring the end of nuclear tests of all kinds in every environment under workable control. We also proposed a mutual ban on atmospheric testing without inspection or controls in order to save the human race from the poison of radioactive fallout. We regret that that offer has not been accepted. Together we shall save our planet, or together we shall perish in its flames. The young president had a unique proposal in which the youth of America could actively work for the cause of world peace. I have today signed an executive order providing for the establishment of a peace corps on a temporary pilot basis. I'm also sending to Congress a message Proposing authorization of a permanent peace corps. This corps will be a pool of trained men and women sent overseas by the United States government or through private institutions and organizations to help foreign countries meet their urgent needs for skilled manpower. It is our hope to have between 500 to 1,000 people in the field by the end of this year. We will send Americans abroad who are qualified to do a job. We will send those abroad who are 
committed to the concept which motivates the Peace Corps. It will not be easy. None of the men and women will be paid a salary. They will live at the same level as the citizens of the country which they're sent to, doing the same work, eating the same food, speaking the same language. We're going to put particular emphasis on those men and women who have skills in teaching, agriculture, and in health. Harvard man Kennedy received an honorary degree from Yale. I am particularly glad to become a Yale man because as I think about my troubles, I find that a lot of them have come from other Yale men. Hallows were always happy. The goodbyes were always sad. During a visit to Mexico, Jackie again helped the president practice personal diplomacy. El antiguo espíritu de México es lo que no ha cambiado. Este nos hace recordar que el progreso material se puede alcanzar sin destruir los valores del corazón y la mente humana. ¡Viva México! Sí, uh, muchas gracias, amigos. Constantly accompanied by the press and always surrounded by the public, the sea was a haven. During July of 1962, CIA reports indicated a Soviet missile buildup in Cuba. In August and September, U-2 photographic missions took place to verify the facts. On October the 14th, evidence of the missiles was verified by aerial photographs. And two days later, they were placed before the president. On October the 16th, the president summoned to the White House his closest advisors in foreign and military affairs. This top-level emergency meeting was conducted in utmost secrecy. The president knew that the time for decision and courage had come. The decision had to be made by one man. The courage had to be his. President Kennedy maintained his normal schedule of public appearances. I have come to this uh, center of learning in order to come back to uh, my college, Yale, and I 
and enjoy that warm reception I've gotten from my fellow Eli's as I drove into this uh, city. The next day at the White House, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko paid a call on the president before returning to Moscow. Kennedy avoided mention of his knowledge of the Soviet threat in Cuba. Secrecy was vital. Congressional leaders, unaware of the nature of the crisis, were hurried to Washington in Air Force jets. There's Germany things in a fire at the present time. Here is the Berlin situation. I see there's a, a, an intensive flare-up in the uh, India-China picture. Here are these developments in Cuba. Kennedy ordered the Pentagon, the State Department, and the CIA to work through the night, preparing for any eventuality. On October the 22nd, President Kennedy reached a decision. Acting therefore in the defense of our own security and of the entire Western Hemisphere and under the authority entrusted to me by the Constitution as endorsed by the resolution of the Congress, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. This quarantine will be extended if needed to other types of cargo and carrier. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to haul and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace. Let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort on which we have set out. No one can foresee precisely what course it will take or what course or casualties will be incurred. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission. All right, sir. Let me ask you one simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation, yes or no? И поэтому не, не хочу отвечать на вопрос, который задается в прокурорском плане. Put to me in the Please. fashion in which a prosecutor does. Yes. In due course, sir, you will have your reply. You're in the court of world opinion right now, and you can answer yes or no. You have denied that they exist. I want to know if you, if this, if I've understood you correctly. Uh, I should not continue. Sir, would you please continue your statement? You will have your answer in due course. Stevenson, would you continue your statement, please? You will receive the answer in the due course. Do not worry. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over. Is that your decision? The proof had been shown, and for four days the world waited. Finally, a reaction came from Moscow. The president went on the air to report the final chapter to the crisis. I want to take this opportunity to report on the conclusions which this government has reached on the basis of yesterday's aerial photographs, namely that the Soviet missile bases in Cuba are being dismantled, their missiles and related equipment are being crated, and the fixed installations at these sites are being destroyed. 
The United States intends to follow closely the completion of this work through a variety of means, including aerial surveillance, until such time as a equally satisfactory international means of verification is effective. The continuation of these measures in air and sea is in keeping with our pledge to secure their withdrawal or elimination from this hemisphere. And it is in keeping with the exchange of letters with Chairman Khrushchev of October 27th and 28th. We will continue to keep the American people informed on this vital matter. As president, John F. Kennedy revealed many facets of his personality before press and public alike. You have said, and I think more than once, that heads of government should not go to the summit to negotiate agreements, but only to approve agreements negotiated at a lower level. Now it's being said and written that you're going to eat those words and uh, go to a summit without any uh, agreement at a lower level. Has your position changed, sir? Well, I'm going to have a dinner for all the people who've written it, and we'll see who eats uh, what. Uh. <laughs> We have been subject to such, to, to such a heavy barrage of teasing and <coughs> fun poking and satire. I mean, there have been books on backstairs at the White House and cartoon books with clever sayings and uh, uh, photo albums with uh, balloons and the, and the rest. And now a uh, smash hit record. Can you tell us uh, whether you read and listen to these things and whether they produce annoyment or enjoyment? <laughs> Annoyment. Uh, no, they produce. Uh, I, yes, I have read them and listened to them. Actually, I listened to Mr. Meader's record, but I thought it sounded more like Teddy than it did me. But uh, <laughs> Mr. President, the Democratic platform in which you ran for election promises to work for equal rights for women, including equal pay. Now you have made efforts on behalf of others. What have you done for the women according to the promises of the platform? Well, I'm sure we haven't done enough, and, uh... <laughs> and I am delighted to have a chance to say a few words about this administration's policy, which has been the subject of a good deal of discussion, acrimony, and controversy on wages and prices and profits. Now, I know there are some people who say that this isn't any business of the President of the United States, and uh, that uh, what... Uh, and who believe that the President of the United States should be the honorary chairman of a great fraternal organization and confine himself to ceremonial functions. But that isn't what the Constitution says. And I did not run for President of the United States to fulfill that uh, office in that way. Harry Truman once said there are 14 or 15 million Americans who have the resources to have representatives in Washington to protect their interests and that the interests of the great mass of the other people, 150 or 60 million, is the responsibility of the President of the United States, and I propose to fulfill it. protest against segregation in Alabama brought the issue of racial conflict to a head. Fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstration, parade, and protest, which create tension and threaten violence threatened lives. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk. 
It is a time to act in the Congress, in your state, and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives. It is not enough to pin the blame on others, to say this is a problem of one section of the country or another, or to pour the facts that we face. A great change is at hand, and our task, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change, peaceful and constructive for all. Those who do nothing are inviting shame as well as violence. Those who act boldly are recognizing right as well as reality. This is one country. It has become one country because all of us and all the people who came here had an equal chance to develop their talent. We cannot say to 10% of the population that you can't have that right. Your children can't have the chance to develop whatever talents they have. That the only way that they are going to get their rights is to go in the street and demonstrate. I think we owe them and we owe ourselves a better country than that. The climax of a triumphant three-day tour of Germany came on June the 26th, 1963 in West Berlin. many people in the world who really don't understand or say they don't what is the great issue between the free world and the communist world let them come to Berlin some who say, there are some who say that communism is the wave of the future. Let them come to Berlin. <laughs> and there are even a few who say that it's true that communism is an evil system, but it permits us to make economic progress. Lass the not Berlin in common. Let them come to Berlin. Freedom has many difficulties. And democracy is not perfect. But we have never had to put a wall up to keep our people in to prevent them from leaving us. All, all three men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berliner.
returned to Washington to be greeted by the skipping figure of his two-and-a-half-year-old son, John John. The next month at Moscow, the Test Ban Treaty, perhaps John Kennedy's greatest contribution to the cause of world peace, was signed by the foreign ministers of Great Britain, the United States, and Russia. There is no swift and easy path to peace in our generation. No man who witnessed the tragedies of the last war, no man who can imagine the unimaginable possibilities of the next war can advocate war out of irritability or frustration or impatience. But let no nation confuse our perseverance and patience with fear of war or unwillingness to meet our responsibilities. We cannot save ourselves by abandoning those who are associated with us or rejecting our responsibilities. In the end, the only way to maintain the peace is to be prepared in the final extreme to fight for our country and to mean it. As a nation, we have little capacity for deception. We can convince friend and foe alike that we are in earnest about the defense of freedom only if we are in earnest. And I can assure the world that we are. In October, the president met with author Jim Bishop to discuss a proposed book entitled A Day in the Life of President Kennedy. Mrs. Bishop and I spent four days in the White House with President Kennedy. I think what I was most impressed with was the fact that he seemed to be too young to be a president. He had boundless energy. It came in torrents. always made time for the children. It didn't matter whether a state visit was on or a state dinner. His arms were always open when the children were in the neighborhood. Perhaps the most amusing thing that happened was when I asked Mrs. Kennedy, when the children are naughty, who's the disciplinarian? Who punishes them? And she said, well, my husband, you know, is a little bit lenient, a little bit soft about the children. And they are good children. They seldom have to be chastised. But when it happens, I'm the one who does it. Later in the day, I sat with the president and I said, Mr. President, when the children are naughty, who chastises them? He said, well, you know, Mrs. Kennedy is a little bit lenient, a little bit soft with the children. So if they must be chastised, I'm the disciplinarian in the family. He was a man of great courage, which was part of his upbringing. He was unafraid to discuss anything. I remember bringing up the subject of assassination, and he said, my philosophy and Abraham Lincoln's philosophy are the same. If anyone wants to exchange his life for mine, he can do it. No one can protect you from that. Thank you. 